All right, I want to talk to you today about some things I will miss about this life. Um, another way to say this would be some things that you can't do when you get to heaven. So you better do them now. Okay. Um, just going to go through the, I have five of them listed here. And uh, we're going to look at the scriptures that kind of line up with this. Um, preaching the word of God. No preaching the word of God in heaven. Uh, number two, seeing the salvation of lost people. There's a big one. Number three, living by faith that God will provide your needs. Another big one. Number four, praising my God by faith, not because I can see Him. Uh, we'll get more into that too as we go through the Scriptures. And number five, learning about Jesus Christ and the church through marriage. Hmm. Show you the Scriptures on that one as well. Um, how long is it going to be till the Lord says, okay, time to go home? I don't know. Uh, it seems like it could be coming very soon, but, you know, you never know. I mean, it, it could still be a little while. We could still be here for a few years yet on this earth. Really have no idea, but um, just some things to think about just to keep your mind focused on eternal things, not on things on this earth. Okay, so let's look at the scriptures here. Turn in your King James Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Certain somebody here behind me is rather excited because a lot of the snow is melting and now he has, he can, you know, ride on the ground instead of on the snow. So, won't mention any names or anything. So, <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Um, there's no time off for you as a Christian when it comes to preaching the Word of God. Um, and I, I realize, you know, men are the ones who preach, you know, but women have their own ministry, their own calling to be able to study the Word and to be able to witness to people and whatever else. Witnessing is fine for a Christian lady. Verse 3, speaking about today. <laughs> For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Um, church buildings today, first of all, there's no support for them, but secondly, they are filled with fables. People that have itching ears. They want the music according to their style, according to their likes. They want the decor and, and the way that they dress and the, everything. God's not going to tell them to do anything. That's what it's all about. Why? Well, we're in that time. The time will come. Uh, that time is now. The end times, in other words, last days. 5, verse 5. But watch thou in all things. Don't fall for this other stuff. You as a Christian, you're supposed to watch. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Um, you're going to have to go through it. You're going to suffer. If you suffer, you'll reign with Jesus Christ. But when you stand for the truth of God's holy word, you will endure afflictions. People will attack you. They'll cast out your name as evil. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you know what I'm talking about. A real Bible believer. I've, I've noticed that the enemies now are starting to call themselves Bible-believing Christians. It's so funny. Uh, you know, always trying to infiltrate, always trying to you know, imitate us that are truly saved. Um, if you see somebody, by the way, that says, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, and they go to church, they wear Sunday best, they, they you know, uh, whatever, stuff like that. Uh, they have things that they do that are not in the Scriptures. Um, and, you know, I realize somebody, some smarty pants is going to say, well, you know, it's not in the Scripture. Yeah, I know. Public ministry. Okay, that's what this is. Um, but, you know, you get these people that, that just have these church buildings and all these extra biblical stuff, and they say we're Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. They're lying to you, okay? But uh, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. We all have received the ministry of reconciliation. We're all supposed to be trying to witness to people in whatever way we can. Make full proof of thy ministry. You're supposed to study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I know it says study to show thyself, not yourself, but I'm speaking to you. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. But uh, verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Can you say that? 
Are you ready to depart? Hmm. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I hope you can say that. I haven't always been real faithful. I haven't always done my best. You say, well, what are you going to do? Well, tomorrow's a new day. Today's a new day. You know, get back in fellowship with the Lord. I have heard from a lot of Christians, you get away from the Lord, you get away from His Word, and you start to mess around with the world. Well, restart today. Because uh, the time of your departure could be at hand. And I mean the catching up of the body of Christ or even your death could be coming soon. And I'll tell you right now, if you're messing around with the flesh, uh, the time of your death could be at hand. If you're saved, the Lord could chasten you and get to the point where he says, okay, you're not listening. I'm just going to take you home now because you're making a mockery of me and my word. Better think about that. The wages of sin is death, okay, for saved or lost people. Now, lost people, they go to hell when they die. Um, but for you as a Christian, if you're messing around with sin, you are earning wages. Those wages can, can get you killed early. Remember that. Verse 8, very important verse here. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, Paul, in other words, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And I've gone through that verse so many times in my studies on the, the time of Jacob's trouble, the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, called the pre-trib rapture. Are you looking forward to uh, the Lord coming? Because you're not, if you're anything else other than uh, quote-unquote pre-trib. If you are post-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib the whole way through, mid-trib, whatever, you're not looking for Jesus Christ. You're looking for the Antichrist to show up, and then that starts your end-time scenario. Okay, It's kind of funny that, that Paul writes an awful lot about um, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, like we read earlier there. Um, and, you know, in the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, there's all these things about the last days, and yet Paul never mentions the Antichrist. Paul never says, hey, when you see the Antichrist show up, look out. Okay, that's when things really get bad. He doesn't say that. Isn't it weird that Paul, writing to Gentile Christians and, and Jewish Christians as well, never mentions the Antichrist showing up as a, hey, when this thing happens, then you know it's getting serious. He doesn't say that. Hmm. But uh, are you looking for Jesus Christ? Because if you are, there's a crown of righteousness that's going to be there for you at the judgment seat of Christ. I hope you are. Seeing the salvation of lost people, number two, things that I will miss about this life. Seeing the salvation of lost people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn you there in your King James Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Another crown, actually, at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 through 20. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. There's a lot of you that I'd love to see your, your face, face to face, not Skype, not, you know, live stream thing or whatever. I'd like to fellowship with you. But we can't right now. You are wherever God has you, and we are here, you know, on our land, uh, up here in northern Maine, to witness to people in northern Maine. We can't be together right now. Uh, we can't form some kind of a Christian holy city where we can all just, you know, sit around and fellowship and whatever. No, the Lord has you where you're at for a reason. He has you there to witness to friends and family, co-workers, people that you meet out in public and whatever else, you know. But it sure would be nice to get together, wouldn't it? Well, we will be when the Lord says, come up hither. Verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. It's amazing how the devil will hinder you from going out and preaching the gospel or even going out and seeing other brethren sometimes. I've seen that. Verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Hmm. For ye are our glory and joy. Uh, you'll get glory and joy from, from uh, other Christians, being around other Christians, the fellowship of the Spirit there. 
such a neat thing to, to be around other people of like mind. And, uh, you know, it just, it's, it's neat because it just crosses any kind of um, nationality, ethnicity, age, whatever else kind of thing, experiences, your job or whatever, doesn't matter. You're, you meet a true born again believer and you'll have instant fellowship and you just want to talk and talk and talk. Uh, it's neat. And it's especially neat when you hear of somebody brand new getting saved. I love to hear that. I love to be contacted by people and they say, um, Brother Brian, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I recently got saved as a result of your ministry. And I've been watching the videos and I've been growing. I'm changing. Things are changing so much in my life. It's amazing. I thank the Lord for your work. And I'm like, wow. But uh, when I leave this life, that's not going to happen anymore. When the Lord says, come up hither, my chances to lead people to Jesus Christ are going to be gone. Going to be over. So, you keep that in mind. When the Lord gives you opportunities to witness to people, um, that's the only chance you're going to get to do that. I'm not saying you might not get a chance you know, a couple times with some person you work with or whatever else, but what I'm saying is once the Lord says come up hither, the chances of, see, of you seeing people being born again is over. Nobody's going to need to be saved up there. Okay? <laughs> I know it's a good thing, but you know it's a convicting. It's very sobering as well to think of, that, that joy of, of seeing somebody get saved, you hear that somebody get, is born again and their life is changing and wow, it's just so exciting. That's neat. And that's actually some uh, a level of joy that we experience here on this earth, but we won't be experiencing it in heaven. But we'll have the joy there of actually being able to be together face to face, which is going to be great. But hearing of those new births won't be up there. Better enjoy it now. Number three, living by faith that God will provide your needs. Philippians 4.19. You ought to know this verse if you're, you've been saved for a while. It's a good memory verse. Good one to, to have in your mind there. Especially now with things going the way they are. Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Um, God will provide your needs, okay? Romans 8, 28, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. As rough as things are getting right now, as a Christian, you can say, you know what? God has a purpose in this. And we know what it is. It's, it's prophecy being fulfilled. Um, God's judgment is coming on these wicked people out there in the world who have no time for God, who have just laughed at Jesus Christ and make jokes about Him and, and say just, horrible stuff about him their time has come okay our time is just about over something really to think about there but here's my point as we look at things getting worse and worse you can say well i believe that god is going to provide my needs because it says so in philippians 4 19 i believe the bible oh but you should sign up for this and you should sign up for that and whatever yeah, well, I don't know. Let me just pray about this. Let me, let me see if God has a plan here. God will provide my needs according to that verse of Scripture. And isn't it neat when He does? Again, I've, I've had so many experiences in my life um, where I'm just thinking, okay, I'm done. I'm finished. You know, and, and especially being in ministry. And, and uh, you know, well, all right, I'm just going to have to sell this or do that or whatever else, I, you know got this bill to pay or this thing I need or whatever else. And the Lord provides my needs right at the last minute a lot of times. Uh, trying of my faith. Um, and He'll do that. Sometimes it'll seem just totally hopeless. This, it's not going to work. Uh, we're going to lose this or that or whatever else. And the Lord will pr provide your need. Or He might be saying, hey, I, don't, I want you out of that situation. So I'm going to let that thing fall apart so you can move and get into a different situation, get a different job because of whatever, and you'll see it worked out for good, but not in heaven. God will provide your needs up there, but it's not the same thing. You don't have to live by faith up there. It's going to be by sight. It's a real blessing sometimes to be able to see the Lord do things here when you don't see it coming. It's kind of a neat thing. Praising 
my God by faith, not because I can see him. Come out into a place like this and I'm just, I'm so thankful for this land and everything. And, and there's just so many things we discover here and, and uh, plants and, and birds and bugs and I mean, uh, insects. Some people are creeped out by them, but depending on what they are, I think they're kind of neat. But you know, whatever, nature. And you just look at something, you think, wow, how in the world could you make something like that? I mean, that's just, that is amazing. Wow, Lord, you're, you're just, you are so far beyond what I can even fathom that you could create this, everything out here in this system, how it all works together and, and just the intricacies and complexities of nature, just wow. And you can praise him for it. Let me show you a verse that lines up with this. John chapter 20. Go to the book of John chapter 20. Praising God by faith, not by sight. John chapter 20, verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. It's very clear that Jesus Christ is holy, completely God. Verse 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You know, there's a special blessing that comes to you if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you praise him by faith, more so than even the disciples of Jesus had. The men that walked the earth with Jesus Christ had less of a blessing than you do as a Christian. Come out here and you just say, wow, Lord, I praise you. I thank you. God that, that made the heaven and all things that are therein. Wow, just amazing. What a beautiful day, Lord. And you're praising somebody that you can't even see. It's a little bit easier for, for the disciples to praise Jesus when he's standing right there with them. There's no question. There's no mystery in their mind. What does Jesus look like? I don't know. They did. Uh, what is the sound of Jesus' voice like? I have no idea. But they knew. And yet the Bible says right there, Jesus said, there's a greater blessing to those who have not seen and yet believe. But that's going to be gone when we get to heaven. So you better do it now. You better take your chances to praise the Lord now. You better take the chances to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You better do it now when you can't see Him so that you can get the greater blessings that are here when you can live by faith. It's going to be great when we get to heaven. Don't get me wrong. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be beyond anything we can fathom. But there's a greater blessing when you're doing it right now and greater rewards when you do it right now when you're doing it by faith the just shall live by faith Romans chapter 1 turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I just, you know, I think one of the most, there's, there are certain things that just fascinate me. And one of those things is the, is the theory of evolution, you know. And I think to myself, the only people that could really fall for it are people that live in the city and just live surrounded by what man has made. I mean, because you'd have to be a, just a simpleton, just low IQ simpleton to come out here and say, all of this complexity happened by chance, came from an explosion billions of years ago. <laughs> you just think, how could anybody fall for that? I mean, really, truly fall for it. I know why they do it, because they're God haters. They reject the Bible. That's why they accept anything, you know, and evolution is the best shot that they have, you know. Yeah. Um, but you come out here and you say... Wow, like I said earlier, you know, you praise the Lord for what all you see and you think, God, you're real. And I know you as my father. How amazing. Um, thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the breath that I'm breathing and the food in my stomach and, the, and just the air that I'm breathing, I should say, not the breath that I'm breathing. But, you know, how amazing. But... uh 
Right now is the chance for me to give God the glory for this down here. And this is nothing, again, compared to what heaven's going to be like. Um, I, I mean, again, we're living in a wrecked earth. This isn't how God originally created it. You know, the, the, before the flood in the days of Noah, um, people were living to be almost a thousand years old. I think the earth was much different back then. I know it was much different back then. You read the scriptures, you study the issue. It was a lot different back then, a lot healthier to live back then. Um, and it's going to be restored back to that in the thousand-year kingdom. Uh, it's going to be pretty amazing. But uh, right now is the time to praise him for what he's done, for what he's made. And you can look out here and you can see his power and Godhead. And you say, Jesus Christ, by him all things consist. He created all things. He's not some kind of a lesser being, a second member of the Trinity. No, he's, he is God. Holy, completely God. Wow. And he walked this earth. You think, Boy, that's just so amazing. Just the Creator coming down in the form of man, taking on corruptible flesh, and He's walking around on this earth that He's made, that He's created. And He dies on the cross and wants to know me personally. He died for my sins. Wow. <laughs> what a thought. What an amazing thought. Finally, learning about Christ in the church through my marriage. Something I can do right now, but not in heaven. Ephesians chapter 5. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So when I get to heaven, I'm not going to be walking around hand in hand with my wife, and we're going to be living together, and she'll be a keeper at home and whatever else. No, no. <laughs> Um, talked a lot more about that in other studies, but the whole point I'm trying to make is um, there's something more to marriage than just, hey, um, the need for marriage bed thing. You know what I'm saying? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's there. Not a problem to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife. Not a problem. Um, but there's more to marriage than that. Uh, you say, well, just, you know, having good times and, and, and going out to eat or, you know, if you like to do that, if that's your thing, uh, going out for walks in nature, going vacationing, going, to, you know, well, again, some of that stuff is okay, whatever, but there's more to marriage than that. Um, when you get married, you'll learn an awful lot of spiritual application, husband and wife, and you'll look and you'll say, you know, this lines up very much with the Lord Jesus Christ and the church. How the Lord has to deal with the weaknesses and the frailty of the body of Christ. You'll see that. It's a great blessing and a great challenge for a husband to say, you know what, um, I'm not Jesus Christ and I can never be Jesus Christ, but I need to strive to be more like my Savior, more like Jesus, a better leader to my wife, a better husband, a better man. It's a great challenge and it's only available on earth. Let's look at the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Doesn't mean that your husband is the Lord. But, you know, there's supposed to be reverence there. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Again, you're going to see this comparison. Wife is like the church. Husband is like Jesus Christ. It's a great, you know, mystery there. We're going to see that as we continue. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, you can learn a lot <laughs> when you get married. There are times when you don't really feel like doing something and you're, in your laziness, you think to yourself, you know what, I wish, I wish my wife would take care of that or whatever. And, and the Lord will just kind of, uh, poke you a little bit and he'll say get up out of bed and go do that yourself you're the husband you're the man of the home you take care of it you say well why should I have to the Lord says because I took care of your salvation I take care of providing for you church bride of Christ oh yeah okay 
<laughs> and uh, it's a great challenge. You can learn a lot in marriage that you can't learn when you get to heaven. Uh, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. How much time do you spend, husbands out there, in, uh, in concern for your wife's health, in concern for your wife's well-being? As I've preached before, uh, the Proverbs 31 woman is not pro possible without a Proverbs 31 husband, Proverbs 31 man. You have to provide for your wife. Um, how good would you do as a Christian if Jesus Christ didn't provide for you? Just kind of, ah, you do your own thing. I got my own stuff to do here. I mean, I'm busy. Hey, I'm busy running the universe. What do you want? <laughs> no, uh, he's running the universe and yet he has time. Take out time for you. You start to pray. The Lord says, hey, hold on a second. What's going on? Talk to me. Tell me what's going on. You never come before the Lord and say, hey, Lord, I need to talk to you about something. The Lord says, not now, not now. But then you'll turn around, you'll do it with your wife. Your wife comes and says, hey, I really need to talk to you about something. Uh, whatever. You know, you get these guys watching TV and whatever else. <laughs> Anybody that's watching TV, I mean, very, very serious issues there. But uh, some guy's watching TV, his wife comes up, hey, honey, we need to talk about some, uh, uh, whatever. Wait till the game's over. Uh. Would Jesus Christ do that to the church? No. It's a great challenge. You can only do it here on the earth. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Jesus Christ wants to make your life better. You get saved and the Lord says, okay, I'm going to clean up, help you clean up your health. I'm going to help you clean up all these other things. He's trying to make you better. Again, that's the life of sanctification, the new creature in Christ Jesus. The Lord will start to clean up your life. And as a husband, you get married, it should be your responsibility to say, hey, you know what? Let me, let me see what areas I can encourage my wife in to get her into new skills and new talents and things. And, and, and if she's got some health issues, let me study ways that I can help her with those issues. Let me, let me find, let me, let me work hard so I can provide her with the kind of food that she needs to be in good health. And see, and as you're doing that, as you're working hard and sacrificing your time sometimes to listen to her, to listen to her feelings and her thoughts, you're going to le learn and say, you know what? It's kind of like what the Lord does for me. Hmm. You learn some interesting things about the Lord. Verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Yeah. Society tries to erase that. They try to say, well, we have an equal marriage. We have a 50-50 marriage. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? Um, a husband is supposed to be the head of the wife. That's not 50% you know, her control or 50, 50, you know, 50 my control, 50% her control. No, it isn't. That's not a biblical marriage. Okay? I um, heard a, a joke the one time. Some guy said, um, you know, we have a 50-50 marriage, you know, at home. And he said, uh, I tell my wife what to do and she tells me where to go. <laughs> that's, that's uh, you know, kind of a, a, a lot of the way that modern marriages are, you know. Um, but you get into the media and they, and they try to say that, you know, women's rights, equal rights, all this other stuff and everything else. Um, women are different than men. It's not that women are lower down or whatever else and should be kicked on and stomped on like, you know, Muslim women or something. No, no, no. Women, women are different. Women have different talents, different skills, different abilities from the Lord, different ways that they receive, you know, revelation from God. And you need to learn how that system works, that proper marriage system works. But you can only do it in this life. 
get up there to heaven and, and my wife, I'll, I'm sure I'll remember who she is. She'll remember who I am or whatever, but we're not going to be married in heaven. We're going to be as the angels of God when we get there. So if I'm going to learn about things and get closer to the Lord, I got to do it in this life through my marriage. You're single. Well, that's a blessing, you know, in and of itself. There's other, other good things about being single as a Christian, but, uh, if you're married, Ephesians chapter 5, go through that. Um, don't spend your whole life just kind of serving yourself in the marriage. Don't spend your whole existence down here on the earth thinking about your needs. Okay? Jesus Christ thinks about your, your needs. He takes care of the church. If you're a husband, you need to take care of your wife. It's a great blessing. It really is. So... How much more time do we have? Like I said, no idea. I have no idea. But uh, those things that we can do right now on this earth, let's focus on those. Because when we get to heaven, that time's over. So just a little, little bit of a challenge to you today, just to, to, to remember the eternal. Um, as we see, you know, our looking at the world and seeing things going as they are and whatever else, things are getting nuttier all the time. Um, think about eternal things. Think about those things that you can't do when you get to heaven. Okay, I hope that's been a challenge to you. And we will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.